Hello, good afternoon. My name is Dana Scoulet. I'm one of the Canadian Features Programmers here at TIFF, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second screening of Anthropocene, the Human Epoch, directed by Edward Bertinsky, Jennifer Bejewal, and Nicolas de Pontier. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat, and we're grateful to live and work in this community. I would also like to acknowledge that we have a guest in the audience today, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Your Honor, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> um, also, the film is eligible for awards like the Canada Goose Award for Best Canadian Feature Film, the Grolsch People's Choice Award, and the Grolsch People's Choice Documentary Award. So you can vote for your favorite films at TIFF dot net slash vote. Um, I'd also like to thank Mongrel Media and Seville International for providing us with the film. And um, I'm so pleased to uh, introduce this film today. This team really doesn't need an introduction. Um, this is, of course, the third collaboration between Edward Bertinsky, Jennifer Bejewal, and Nicolas de Pontier. They, of course, did Manufactured Landscapes and then Watermark. And um, I would say that their team marks one of the most significant collaborations in documentary filmmaking in recent memory. So it is a real honor to have them back at the festival. Um, their latest is a real deep dive into the enormous impact that we as a species are having on the planet. And the scope of the film is absolutely astonishing. It goes around the world and you know examines our impact in many different arenas. And and that all of this impact results from our demand. Um, it is totally unique. It's at once visceral and arresting and yet very vast at the same time. So really creates the space for us to um, think more deeply about what our impact is. So it is now my pleasure to introduce the filmmakers, Jennifer Bejewal, Edward Bertinsky, and Nick Depontier. Hello. Ed, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, and I'm going to make my thanks. Today. Today. It's 12.30. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's hard to tell what time it is these days. But uh, all I really want to do is just thank my fantastic collaborators. We've been working together now for 13 years. And then um, five years ago, we sat around and said, there's this word Anthropocene that has a deep meaning. And uh, we think everybody should know what this word means because it has to do with all of us. So, so we spent five years putting this together um, and we're really excited about this. And also we're doing a um, exhibition that's going along with it called the Anthropocene. Uh, it's gonna be at the AGO and the NGC opening November 28th. So hope you all get to see that November? as well. September. Oh, September 20th, <laughs> September 20th. Uh, that's the National Gallery of Canada, yeah. right? That's right. And the AGO. Yeah. AGO. Right. yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, it's a real privilege to do what you love uh, in your work. And for us, that's doing these projects. Um, it's a privilege and a responsibility. And uh, I'd like to take a moment just to thank our partners, without whom, of course, we don't get to do what we love. And in this film, uh, we're with a lot of trusted partners uh, who have made the difference between a film happening or not uh, for us in the past, including Bell, TMN. It will play on. Uh, uh, that uh, family of channels uh, later on, and it's uh, as the dominoes fall, TV Ontario, Telefilm, Rogers, uh, the OMDC, recently rebranded as Ontario Creates, and the Canada Media Fund. Um, for us, these are existential partnerships, and if you enjoy these films, um, I hope you appreciate with us the contribution that they make. Personally, uh, taking on a film like this, um, uh, I was inspired uh, by the topic and the the approach that we all collectively uh, decided to take 
because I find in our frenetic uh, lives that there's not a lot of time for sustained reflection and meditation. And especially if there are things that um, you identify in your life that you might consider problems and even global problems, it's hard to step out of the slipstream and the, the, the vortex um, of, of uh, the immediate and try and consider them from a distance. And so part of the ambition of this film is to look at the whole human project in geological time and on a planetary scale. Uh, so I hope through the magic of cinema, that's something that we've been successful in bringing to you today. We also, you know, TIFF has been a partner. We're just, we're just so grateful for this relationship. And, and uh, you know, this is our hometown and to premiere here and we've the audiences that we see at every film and we're just, we're, we're grateful because these are not easy topics that we're uh, addressing often. So thank you uh, for having us. Um, and our biggest thanks really go to the Anthropocene Working Group, this group of scientists that is, have been doing research for 10 years into the extent and quality of human impact on the Earth. They were the inspiration for this. They have uh, helped us structure it in terms of their research. And so we, we owe a big debt to them. Um, all of our team at Mercury Films, just wonderful that we've been we've been on a bit of a roll with Black Code and then the hip film, which we kind of interrupted this film to make for obvious reasons um, of, of wanting to do that and the time sensitivity of it, and then came back to this immediately afterwards. So it's been about a, a four year sprint. Um, and uh, uh, our my editor, Roland Schlimm, our editor, who's not here right now. Why isn't Roland here? But uh, Roland and I have been together in the edit room for the past five films, and I'm telling you, it's very intense, <laughs> our process. And it's, you know, it's a long time. Like, we're in there for 10 months to a year. And um, uh, figuring it out together, sort of forensically going through everything. And, and uh, I said at the other screening, it's like making a giant puzzle without ever seeing the picture of what the puzzle is supposed to look like. That's kind of our way. Um, so thank you to Roland and also our post partners, um, you know, uh, Pat and Mark and um, Frank at Technicolor and especially Lou and Dave at Sim among everyone else who helps us to make the film what it is when you see it projected. Um, and I just want to finish with this. We, we talked to this one scientist who said something that Ed said he really liked, uh, because she said, why is it so easy for us to do the wrong thing and hard to do the right thing? And how can we make it so that it's easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing? So I've been thinking about that. And I've also been thinking about the fact that this, this film is kind of heavy, but there is also hope because we as a species have obviously thrived. <laughs> Can we turn our attention towards um, uh, the systems of the earth and pulling them back into a, into a safe envelope? And can we be inspired by uh, meditations like that, this, to, to do that? that? That's our goal. So thank you. We'll see you after. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you could, please welcome the filmmakers Jennifer Beishwal, <laughs> Nicholas DePontier, and Ed Bertinsky. Thank you. Questions? Comment? Oh, yeah, right there. <laughs> that was fast. Yes. Uh, lady wonder what uh, uh, um, what was the most difficult environment for you guys to be in when you were making the film? Can I just sorry. if you have multiple chemical sensitivity, don't go to Norilsk, Siberia because Precisely. you walk off the plane and we didn't know it, but actually the one of the smelters uh, was directly upwind from the airport and we thought, I, I seriously wondered if we were actually going to be able to work there because our eyes were streaming and we were coughing in the airport. 
um, and we were ready for we were ready to go there to experience that and to uh, try and capture it. But that was an assault. Yes. Yeah, but hold on. Like there, I mean, I just want to say that when we go into these places, like there are people who live there all year round, and we're going there for whatever. We were there for a week or something, and it, it, it's just so um, incredible to feel the privilege of 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 where we are here and and not having to live with that and that. I mean, Norilsk is very polluted because it's in completely unscrubbed there, and 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 so these stacks are going all the time, and they have their their sort of environmental policy is to turn them off if it's blowing towards the town, especially on a holiday, which is when we were one of the days that we were there for the metallurgy festival. So, um, but it's a, it's a it's an intense environment. Being in the mines is intense. I have asthma, and so I'm very sort of sensitive to dust and that kind of thing. And so you know, you're in a place where you're just coated all the time. But again, you just think to yourself, "Holy shit!" There are people who are working here every day. So, yeah, and as well on the Rilsk, uh, when you when we were inside the foundry, um, it was constantly burning your lungs, and uh, you saw maybe one of the gentlemen, one of the workers there, was breathing through a tube when they were where they were pouring the metal. Uh, so we all had to have canisters to breathe because the, uh, the sulfur dioxide was so um, harsh that y your lungs feel raw when you're bre breathing it. So it is a really rough, rough spot. <laughs> In the middle there. The lady was surprised and upset by the uh, open coal mine in Germany, given that the impression about Germany is that uh, it's actually a little more progressive that way. Do a lot of people know about that coal mine in Germany? I mean, one of the philosophies of our filmmaking is um, uh, to take you to places that you're somehow implicated in and involved with. Um, and Canada has its equivalents, uh, certainly. Um, and there's a lot of manufacturing in Westphalia that we buy things that are powered by that coal. It's not something that's happening over there, right? This is this is all of us. And so um, what we're trying to do is bring a, a, a witnessing and an experiencing of these places. And it is shocking. And, and the truth is always much more nuanced and messy than sometimes you know, it's easier to tell a story if it's things are black and white and easy. Um, and Germany is an absolute leader in in uh, alternative energy, um, and and yet they need baseline power, like all utilities need baseline power. And alternative energy doesn't always provide that. And they got out of nukes a while ago, and so they're here with this incredibly dirty, polluting legacy coal project. And I don't know, in Germany, they tend to be quite environmentally aware how many people know about it, but now you know about it. I think people know about it because they protest every time. There was this beautiful old forest, Hombach Forest, that was hundreds of years old that is now gone, just like the town of Immerath is gone. But you say it's 30% is coal yeah, in 30 Germany? 30% coal and 70% um, alternative energy. But it's, <clears throat> it's called lignum. Uh, it's a lignite. Brown, lignite, a yeah. brown coal, very soft and considered one of the worst polluters in terms of uh, burning it for for energy. So it's really for, uh, obviously, for power plants, and I'm sure for some steel plants, they're using that as well. Yeah, I think I was trying to remember the exact stat, because it's somewhere between 5 and 7%. Just that mine alone creates this huge amount of energy for Germany. So, you know, it was quite a place. <clears throat> um, yeah, right there, and then we'll get over there. Go ahead. Gentleman noted that you filmed in a lot of different communities, and he, he wondered uh, what uh, what reaction you got from the people in those communities when you explained the concept of the film in the Anthropocene. Well, first of all, how many people in this room knew what that word meant before? So you know, so when we did this, this we started to make this. We decided to do this when we were on tour with Watermark, and Ed and I were walking through Washington, saying, "Should we do another project together?" And uh, and it was, "Should we whatever?" And I said, "What about 
Anthropocene. Nobody knows what that word means, right? And uh, maybe we can help make, bring it into the vernacular more because it's a, it's a huge concept, right? So the first thing was to explain it, right? In, in most cases, it's like people either don't know or don't care. Um, and then, uh, you know, do they know what that means? And then just, you know, to, uh, I don't know, what, what, what did we do? <laughs> did I don't know if we, we tried to explain, explain it. I don't think we tried in a <laughs> lot of cases. We... just said, we're doing this mine or, you know. Yeah, the, there's obviously, we're um, always trying to be mindful of the ethical dimension of traveling somewhere that you are not of and trying to represent that place and especially those people. Um, and so we try and be as as open and honest as we can, and and ironically that that helps us sometimes after a year of work get access to places that it's very hard sometimes politically to get access to, like a coal mine, um, uh, but also somewhere like a Dandora landfill, let's say, um, where our worlds are are very different. Um, and so absolutely, we try and explain exactly what we're doing and what our project is. Um, and uh, and have as authentic a an exchange and and relationship as we can when we're there. We don't travel with a script. We try not to come with preconceived ideas of what we're trying to get out of that location. We do a lot of research and then try and be really open to um, what we feel is actually happening and trying to be yeah very in a mindful place while we're there. Yeah, right there in the pink. Uh, gentlemen, I was impressed by the uh, images of nature and industry, but also the uh, uh, the uh, portrayal of people in it. Do you want to talk about those different um, those different aspects of the film? Maybe I'll talk about the human, and Ed can talk about scale a bit more. Because from from manufactured landscapes on, uh, to me, it was always crucial one to um, how do you express scale in a time based medium? So in this film, I mean, in manufacturing landscapes, it's the opening shot. Here, it's kind of the Gotthard based tunnel, the endless tunnel, 57 kilometers through the Alps. But it's also the, the dialectic of scale and detail. And, and it's about without those rooted moments, without those little moments with the, I can't believe that those crane operators said, you know, you see the be beauty in a flower bursting through the stone, or, uh, you know, these, the, the Russian miners who are talking about being recorded. We love our job. You know, I mean, that, I feel like <laughs> that without those grounding moments, you, the, the big picture loses meaning. And so there has to be a balance. And when, we're in the edit room when I am editing with Roland. Um, I'm always thinking about that back and forth and how one thing illuminates the other, uh, and then that happens uh, backwards as well. So, and you want to talk about the yeah, big and picture? From the, from the very beginning, when I did research on my work, I was always looking for the largest example of something, the largest you know, uh, copper mine, the largest iron ore mine. Uh, largest factories in China. So always that scale was always interesting to me as a photographer. So when we transferred over to film, uh, we, we, we try to keep some of that aerial view or the big view. And it's almost like an inversion of the sublime. If you think in the past, it was nature that was the great sublime. And you think of Turner and you think of you know, Moby Dick, you know, nature is an omnipresent force. We are dwarfed by its power. And now we live in a world where we are the force and we're dwarfed by our own creation. So my images are always about that, trying to, in high resolution, trying to find that small human moment, a truck or a person against that mind. And the beauty of working with film and with, with talent like, you know, Jennifer and Nick is that, it, 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 even from manufactured landscapes, I, I was really uh, thrilled and amazed to see the context of, of these images, where these images come from, and giving you a deeper understanding that these are, you know, intentional landscapes made by people like you and I, and they're, you know, something to kind of behold as a, as, as a human enterprise, the kind of scale that we need to provide for almost 8 billion people. So. I think that duality uh, is critical to 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 making you know all three of these films. Yeah, and it's not an indictment, right? I mean, we're all implicated in this, so we, we let's let's witness it, recognize it, understand it, and then 
um, try to shift shift it. Yeah, yeah, the person with his hand up, yeah. <laughs> That's under, not, not under our control. Uh, yeah, Steve, I, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, I, I, I work in programming. Uh, uh, you know, it. Uh, let's move on. Maybe we can discuss it uh, outside. But uh, thanks for the observation. The the question, the question was, was uh, the uh, uh, the gentleman noted the three very consumer uh, oriented advertisements prior to the film, and given the nature of the film, it seemed sort of. Oh God! So, it's it's so all over the place. There's even like, where did I see? Where did I? You had a plastic straw today, from downstairs. Like, I mean, it, it just yeah. To be clear, we, we, we don't receive any remuneration from those three ads. Um, <laughs> however, let's let's just extrapolate. We're we are super happy to be in this festival, which is an amazing arena for cinema and per, and for film, and has programmed our film, which sure has an environmental agenda, but also one that is meant to be inclusive, that isn't meant to be divisive and saying, you know, you guys are bad, we environmentalists have the right answer. It, it is all of us. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for the question. And it's it's worth noting. I always cringe at that and the juxtaposition of that. Um, uh, but the solution is going to have to be holistic. It's going to have to include those ads as well. We can't all just compartmentalize. I never watch trailers, actually. Uh, it, right there, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I think the... Yeah. What, what what was the motivation for the what what do you think the motivation for the communities was when you when they let you guys shoot? Uh, well, um, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, from the very beginning, one of the first locations I ever got access to uh, was the uh, Inco mines uh, up in around Sudbury, and I managed to get to know management here in Toronto who um, were interested in culture and art, and I was basically saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a photographer. I want to do these large scale. Um, you know, interventions, uh, and I want to show the largest. So it began there, and then uh, as, as uh, time went on, uh, uh, you know, there were different techniques. I worked with researchers, and I worked with other assistants to help me get access in China, elsewhere. So it became a team effort. Now, with the films, it's a, a much larger team effort. And it's really just kind of trying to find w an angle. Like the RWE, at first, it was absolutely not. And then there was a collector of mine and, uh, that my dealer in, in, in Germany knew. And then you know, th 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 this collector was on the board of RWE, and they put in a word for us. And, and in a way, because we're, you know, we're, we're not accusatory, we're more revelatory. And that's the position we take. And we're saying, look, we just want to show large scale you know, human enterprise at the biggest scale we can find it, because I think it's something interesting to connect you know, people who live in cities to the other things necessary for their lives. And, and so we're trying to be that conduit of that landscape to, to us in, in, in urban centers, because most of us are now living in urban centers. So I think they understand that. And, and I think that, again, different teams, different times. But in this case, we, I think we had four or five researchers at any given time. And then also people who were helping apply. And then we would apply our own uh, letter writing, um, our, our connections. But it's usually through connections, though. Well, I will say though that the, the RWE has not seen that. No, they're scene not going to be happy. So that that's one thing they haven't seen it, and maybe we won't be in Germany when they when they do see it. And the other thing is, we got arrested in Norilsk, and we were detained and then sort of dogged for the rest of the trip because they claimed not just because we were. I mean, there were all kinds of reasons of shaking us down, but the, one of the things was we were talking to the women crane operators, and only a journalist would do that. So we came in under false pre pretense, as we said, this is an art film and an art project, and we're, we're you know, when we told them about the anthropology, and then they, they, they detained us and said, you lied, you have to sign this paper that said that you lied, um, and we didn't, and we said, we're not journalists, and it was just this back and forth for, for a long time, and so it's not always, you know, a happy sort of situation when, when, they, when they let us in, and there's often a lot of, of negotiating that goes on on the ground about what we can film. Okay, uh, the, the gentleman there, yeah. Uh,
gentleman wanted to know about the, he noted that you didn't have a traditional script and if you want to talk about that process. Well, I mean, it goes back to, it, I think we've said that in every single one of these films, and in fact, um, uh, in almost all the films that we've made, it's sort of a philosophy of documentary filmmaking that, um, you know, there are, there are fil films that are much more prescribed, and they write a story, and then they go out and execute that story. And because we are engaging with reality, um, and we're engaging with contexts that we can't predict and that we have to enter with humility, um, uh, I feel, we all feel, uh, we, we don't know what's going to happen. And so we do an enormous amount of research. Um, this one was a year, a year and a half of research. We then sort of try to forget everything when we go into the context and just be in that place and try to, what, what, what is the truth of this place? Can we convey it? How can we convey it without, you know... Um, uh, bugging people too much. I, I never say, you know, could you just say that again? Or could you, you know, could you move over there two feet because the light is better in the shade? And lots of people have no problem doing that. And and it, for me, it, it, it crosses an ethical line. So we shoot tons of footage. Like we have, we have two to 300 to one ratios um, that are, which is 300 hours to one hour, just, I mean, and, and it seems like an incredibly inefficient way of working, but it, it really is about uh, being in that place in an authentic way and then taking all of that footage into the edit room and sifting through it, sifting through it, sifting through it and finding the story with the superstructure of research um, above informing without, you know, um, being uh, sort of dogmatic about what gets included and what doesn't. Yeah, it's really Jennifer and Roland for months in the edit room who, who write the film. Um, the script gets written um, from all the footage, really. You have all these ideas and, and, and these intentions, um, but when you see what you really have, that, that's another, you know, trying to be um, as, as mindful and open to the reality that's in front of you. It happens again in the edit room. Here's what you really brought back from those places. What does it say to you? What does it resonate? And it's really Jennifer and Roland who, who do that work for months and months. Given that, I would just, I would just add oh. one thing. I think the films, also all the films, are uh, very much more about showing and, and not as much about telling. It's letting you experience these things. And it's interesting because I think originally you were interested in how you can transpose still photography into film. And so the first <coughs> film, Manufactured Landscapes, had the stills, but how do you communicate? And they give you that space. And I think it was a trying to transfer that space as well into film. You, these guys have done an amazing job. Okay. Given that it's so much footage, how do you deal with this stuff in translation like that has to be translated? Oh, you wouldn't. You don't want to know. Like we actually translate it all so that we can then see what is there. And in fact, so that Russian mind scene, our only laugh in the whole film. Like I mean, literally, I was. There was no. There wasn't a rooted moment. I mean, everybody's working. It's very difficult conditions. It's really dark. Um, and I kept saying, there's got to be something here that dehumanizes this space. And that was not translated. And it was, I think, month four. And uh, we sent it out again because we found a Russian translator. And I was so happy when that came back because it was like this, this moment, this moment that rooted that whole scene. So I'm afraid we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. But I, you, there, you want to talk a bit about the exhibit at the AGO? Uh, you mean the September 28th one? Yeah. <laughs> on, on, on September 28th, I neglected to mention, but this film is open in theaters, including this theater um, here in Toronto. So if you've enjoyed it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please tell your friends. And, and the AGO and the National Gallery at the end of the month, too. And that's very different. There's augmented reality. There's film installations. There's incredible ed photographs. And uh, we've really sort of used all lenses to explore this, this subject uh, as much as possible. And we just please come to that too, if you can. Thanks. Please check it out. Thank you guys for coming. Congrats on the film. Thank you very much. Thank you.